Thank you. Wow, lucky me, I get to be on stage with my heroine and you get to hear her incredible story facilitated by a wobbly baroness. Um, I was lucky enough to first meet Stevie when I was um, just coming out of my dot-com adventures and beginning to do more work in the kind of things that she's done post her business. But I want to start, because you're all doing your incredible and interesting startups, by asking Stevie, why did you start your business? Well, everybody here wants to make their fortune, and I did eventually make a very small fortune, just 150 million, um, just to sort of keep going. But actually, I started as part of a crusade for women. Now, you know about that. And why did you think it was important to be on a crusade for women? I come across the sexism of the 1950s and 60s so much. I was sick and tired of being patronized, and I really felt that one wanted to show that women could uh, carry out a vigorous professional career, which has given me so much pleasure over the years. And so my company was really a social business. I measured things not in terms of profit, but in terms of revenue and the number of people that we employed. And it was very much a woman's company, a company for women, a company of women, managed by women, with a sort of flexibility and lifestyle that suits a lot of women. And being selfish, it suited me. So tell the audience, in case they don't know what you did and how you started it, because you make it sound so easy, a company run by women for women working flexibly. But this was in the 1960s. Well, in retrospect, of course, it, it all gets glorified. Uh, in fact, it was a struggle. The only technology that we had was the simple telephone. And we literally used to ask job applicants, do you have access to a telephone? <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, it was a company that did tailor-made software. We started off with small jobs for small clients, and we finished up with large jobs with teams of about 300 people, entirely working from home originally, and then later on sort of balanced uh, with, with home working. We did interesting things. Um, the black box flight recorder for supersonic Concorde. Um, the, the market was very much commercial work, which I wasn't terribly interested in, uh, but I, I'm a scientist and I wanted very much to apply that, so I fin finished up in a compromise. And I think a lot of business is compromise. Can't do this? Well, I'll try that. And the compromise that I made in those days was to go for operational research work, which has things like stock control and, and lots of commercial push behind it, uh, but nevertheless um, was sufficiently interesting intellectually so that I don't get bored. And I hate being bored. <laughs> you know, every business when you start, you know, when we started lastminute.com, we had to badger the airlines and the hotels to take two 25-year-olds seriously and give us any product to sell. But to be badgering people who were giving contracts for the black box for Concord, not only that, but also to a group of women all working from home, how the hell did you do that? Well, we were patronized a great deal. I mean, I can remember uh, a junior minister literally patting my bottom um, <laughs> when I was trying to sell a major contract to a government department. And you have no idea, ladies, how easy I think your life is compared with the struggles that I had to be respected, to be allowed to get on with my business and develop the sort of environment that we now all enjoy. Yeah. But do you think that, what do you think the key things were that you got right? Do, we, do you think you were a really brilliant salesperson? Do you think you were just very, very good at the software? Where, when you look back now, what were the key things you think the business really got right? Well, I thought I was very good on the software, but in fact, I was just very early in the game. And uh, what really mattered was, um, could I sell? And I'd been going for some years before I really learned how to sell rather than show off how clever I was. <laughs> um, because I used to be quite aggressive about, uh, uh, oh, that's not the way to do it. You know, come on, Martha, we, we, you know, they, you, you, let me show you. 
And of course, you, as a manager, you, you learn very slowly to um, love your clients, love your teams. And I had a, a wonderful few years really uh, getting involved in the contracts and at the same time having to manage the business. And you find yourself um, cash flow, meeting the solicitors, having a query on the taxes, uh, absolutely very different to how I expected, which would be very esoteric, getting on with the clever stuff. Yes. And do you think that now entrepreneurs have an easier time of it? Or do you think it's always the same being an entrepreneur in whatever age you're living? Do you think the environment has changed substantially over the last 50 years? I think the entrepreneurial process is the same for all of us, that it doesn't matter whether you have a small company or a large company, the problems and, and the joys are, are, are still the same. I mean, people remember me for my few successes, and I have set up now uh, four social businesses, one commercial and three charitable. Um, but um, the sheer excitement of setting something up has to be balanced with the hassle of keeping it going day after day, looking after the staff, looking after the cash flow. And that hasn't really changed. No, that doesn't change. Do you think you just started an internet business? Well, I founded the Oxford Internet Institute, which is concerned not with the technology, uh, but I'm, I'm totally out of date these days. Um, I notice you're still much more with it than I am. <laughs> but, I'm um, concerned with the social, economic, legal, and ethical issues of the internet, which are the things that have always interested me. Uh, I like people, and I think that's a strategy that actually allows you to make some difference in the world. Uh, just doing a little bit of technology is fine. Doing something strategic that really makes an impact on that network of networks. That's great. That's what I like to do. You also started a school. And I know you don't think that that's an entrepreneurial thing to do, but I think that's a pretty entrepreneurial thing to do and you don't know anything about schools. Can you tell us how that came about and whether it was as hard as starting a business or whether there are similarities? Well, the same things come up. I mean, the school is now employs 600 people, it has a turnover of 20 million, um, and it is merely, merely a school for learning disabled and autistic pupils, uh, aged five to 19. And it was set up in much the same way as any business is set up. Some ideas, some planning, some finance, some getting in original contractors to find a location, do we did a feasibility study. I do all the things that I've always done in business, but in a not-for-profit area. And this charity is now, well, I think it's probably what I will always be remembered for. Um, I used to think it was my company, but after 45 years, that got acquired by someone. It changed its name twice, and people have almost forgotten how it started as freelance programmers. But the school, the charity, Prior's Court, I think we'll be there in 50 years' time. I'm enormously proud of it. Do you think we make too much of a distinction between social entrepreneurs and the profit entrepreneurs? No, I think they're exactly the same, yeah. just the measures are slightly different. And do you think that, because I, one of the things that I find interesting is that you kind of rarely get a group of entrepreneurs in classic way who are social entrepreneurs. They always seem to be still such a big kind of division between... Well, maybe because we're still struggling so much to survive <laughs> that we don't have time to sort of network in the same maybe sort of way. Maybe that's it. I'm struggling to survive. Do you feel bleak about the state of the world or do you feel optimistic? Well, I'm a glass half full person uh, and I do feel very worried about the state of the world. Luckily, it's not my responsibility to do something about it so I can opt out of all that. But I do find that whereas the last few years, the few decades have, to me as a refugee, uh, been pretty good, materially good, intellectually good, spiritually good, 
uh, but suddenly um, things have changed and um, I am worried about what will happen. Do you feel the same? I feel as though we have this incredible and unbelievable power at our fingertips in the internet. You know, I've worked my whole life in technology. When I started in my first job, my very first um, role was as a consultant in a consulting company, and I was sent all over the world to benchmark the information superhighway. Oh, do you remember that? The information superhighway? You're all probably too young. And I went to Japan and Canada and all over the place to see how we were doing on some indices. And that was a time back in the early 90s. And it seemed as though there was going to be this kind of burgeoning excitement, new companies created, new Do you voices. Do something called Prest Prestel? Probably, yes, <laughs> probably. Um, and yet that hasn't been quite how it's worked out. And no. I feel on the one hand, we've got this immense power of the internet. And on the other hand, we face some of the most profound challenges in human history, mass movement of peoples, climate change, arguably non-functioning democracies. And although people are being lifted out of poverty and although many women's lives are substantially better, inequality has risen. Those are the things that I find interesting and challenging. How is it that we have this technology on the one hand and yet we haven't deployed it to solve some of our greatest challenges? I mean, we always, well, I always felt that technology would allow my generation to leapfrog the, the one in, in, in front so that we could actually equalize some of the things across the world and against time. And that just hasn't happened. Um, in this country, I'm almost ashamed of the difference between the rich and poor. And I've been poor. I have fainted from hunger. And you know, you, you never really forget that. And that's why people who have experience of that become much more philanthropic because we, we have uh, sensitivity to some of those social issues. But it, we're in a place with a great spiritual background and I hope you feel it and I hope you are able to apply it in some of your day-to-day -day work. That's a great way of looking at things, to apply some spirituality. I'm not a religious person, but I definitely... Neither am I. No, and I yeah. definitely, but don't you think a kind of generosity of spirit? I think that's my kind of guiding star. If in doubt, be kind. Yes, I, I've got a similar motto. If you don't, if there's no need, it's just greed. Because we can always give more of our time, of our skills, of our expertise, of our money. And I have such a wonderful quality of life. Now, learning to give away wisely the money that I made as an entrepreneur 50 odd years ago. I read recently, Stevie, that they have opened in, I think it's um, an Eastern European country, a museum of failure. Whoops, whoops, and I love that idea. I thought, take it away. And I thought a museum of failure is a great idea. Learn from your mistakes. I wonder when you look back what you think your greatest mistake was. Well, I made so many, but of course people forget that. They just remember your successes. I think the biggest mistake I made, well, I made so many, but I, I was very, very slow in bringing in financial skills. Uh, I'm not a money person. I'm slightly repelled by money. So what am I doing as, as an entrepreneur? Uh, but I didn't employ a finance director until 25 years. And uh, about that time, we started paying our first dividend. So it, it was very different. Um, I think the other big mistake I made, and it's a classic one, I'm sure you've come across it, I tried to set up in other geographic areas, replicate the, the success that I'd had in the UK, and I set up in the Netherlands, then I set up in Scandinavia, then I set up in North and West America. I mean, it was, I was just so ambitious. And of course, it, it didn't take off in any of those. Where my business model did uh, apply, much to my surprise, was India. And we started using Indian labor force at a time when we wanted access to a cheap labor supply. But by the time we'd actually made it happen, uh, it wasn't just cheap labor, it was access to a workforce in, in short supply. And uh, that really showed that you can turn a failure into success. And I think as entrepreneurs, you're always having to cope with that resilience. Well, this doesn't work, let's try something else. Well, I've damaged that, that doesn't work there. So, but you, you always have to 
pick yourself up from your failures, uh, brush yourself down, and move on. And that, in a sense, is, is, is part of the theme of the memoir, which I'm offering for sale for charity uh, later on today, um, because we have so much to give and no need nowadays to take so much of the earth uh, and of people's skills. I don't think that not having a finance director is a failure that uh, many, I think that's one that people many people would that. recognize. I think that's one that many people would recognize, but I'm quite surprised you managed to go 25 years. With <laughs> that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. The one final question, wildly out of time, quick question. I just wondered what you would really have loved to have done in a parallel life. You know, you pioneered a women's software business in the 60s. You were one of the earliest computer geeks, if you forgive me saying that. You've created a school for autistic people. You've changed the base of philanthropy in this country, particularly for dis learning disabled children. What would you love to have done? Opera star, vet, military leader? I was going to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> you still could be. <laughs> I want you to pirouette off the stage. <laughs> Not a hope. <laughs> We've got one minute left, and this is an awful and horrible mean thing to do, and I should definitely have um, prepared you for this one. But if you could just give the audience one piece of advice from all of the different things you've done, from the startup of social businesses or profit businesses, what's the thing you come back to? I think, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's the basic things about find something that you really care about, um, get trained in it, find out about it, surround yourself with people of quality, not, not, and people that you like, not, and I don't mean people like you. Um, master, it's quite a long list, isn't it? Master <laughs> finance, which I didn't do, master marketing, and then just go out and do it. That's the whole point. Do it. Well, I think we can all agree that if anyone can inspire you with that list, it's this incredible woman. I am sad that we weren't uh, contemporaries because I would definitely have applied for a job in your business and I'm sure you'd have turned me down. But I'm happy we're friends now and thank love for your time. Let's give a round of applause for <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.